I don't think there's any question today that there are secret governments. It's clear that there has been an organized effort to discredit every aspect of the UFO phenomenon. The UFO cover-up began uh, with legitimate national security concerns. When you're dealing with the military, especially in, in matters of secrecy, the idea is to deceive. It's likely that we're going to find out for sure whether this Roswell event happened or not. How on earth would you keep a secret like that so long? Almost 60 years after Roswell, the mystery of what crashed in the deserts of New Mexico remains a secret. The government's official stance about the existence of UFOs has always been denial. Eyewitnesses have come and gone. Project Blue Book, the UFO study program of the U.S. Air Force, has gone out of business. But many questions remain. Researchers and private investigators continue to follow every lead in hopes that someday the truth will be revealed. Newly leaked classified government documents may be the first real evidence to shed light on this never-ending story. I decided that instead of looking at photographs or instead of trying to sort out new witness testimony, that it'd be better to try a different approach, which was the approach of, of authenticating documents. Dating from the 1940s and 1950s, these documents refer to extraterrestrial contact and the secret operation established to investigate this phenomenon. This project was led by a group of men appointed by executive order. They operated under the code name Majestic 12, or simply MJ-12. If it is true, that the United States government has pursued a, a very aggressive but deeply clandestine effort to collect and contain information about UFO phenomena, including crashes, military encounters, and whatnot. It is absolutely essential that there be documents about that effort and when I look at the MJ-12 documents, I say to myself, these are the kinds of documents a person would expect to see. This kind of document has to exist. It is the unanimous opinion of the members that Operation Majestic 12 be a fully funded, operational, top secret research and development intelligence gathering agency. It is also recommended that a panel of experts be appointed to chair and oversee the functions and operations of said agency. Its members should have appropriate security clearances. What impresses me most about these documents is all these checkable details. We got so many names to check out, so many dates, and so many places. We'll be at this for the next couple of years, but so far it looks impressive that these things are checking out to be true, real and authentic. A major objection to all the documents is that we don't know who provided them. We have to consider, of course, that whoever did was violating the law and would be subject to enormous penalties for photographing classified documents and giving them to people who don't have any authorization to receive them. It began in 1988 when I began filing Freedom of Information Act requests to the government for any information on UFOs. And then in October 1992, I went to the post office and I pulled out a Time magazine that had a document inserted in it, and I just thought it was a prank. I was working my shift as a security officer at Pine Knot Landing. An old gentleman came to the gate and I said, well, I'm Thomas Cantwell. He told me he was in the Army's Counterintelligence Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit since 1942 and have been involved in the UFO program almost into the 1980s. And he just wanted to let me know that he was real, to tell me everything, get it off his chest, because he didn't think he had much longer to live. The IPU stands for the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, and this is rumored to have been a unit within the Army 
uh, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, some people link the uh, late Douglas MacArthur with this group, but they were involved in some kind of early UFO investigation. My father himself had been involved in the United States Air Force's UFO program for several years. I also learned uh, after my father's death by going through his papers that uh, he was awarded the Air Force Commendation Medal and was given a special citation uh, by order of General LeMay for his outstanding work in the United States Air Force UFO program. It's very clear to me that UFOs are real. The data that we have in hand establishes that beyond a shadow of a doubt to my mind. And that some of them certainly uh, are involve observations of alien spacecraft. This is a completely independent question from whether or not the MJ-12 documents are real themselves and are valid. I had no interest or beliefs in UFOs and I never considered giving any thought to the phenomenon itself. But when your own father tells you they're real, and that the Air Force considered them very threatening to the United States Air Force, then I began to have a different attitude. The documents that Tim Cooper had were really uh, very extensive. There were 100 pages, 50,000 words. The things that they talk about, however, are, are stunning. A consensus reached by members of the panel that until positive proof that the Russians did not attempt a series of reconnaissance flights over our most secure installations, the sightings and recovered objects are interplanetary in nature. Buried in one of these MJ-12 documents is the White Hot Report. It is a reference to a discovery in 1941. This alludes to the possibility that a UFO crashed in the United States six years before the Roswell event. I originally read the first account, at least that I'm aware of, the only real account uh, of the Cape Girardeau 1941 crash retrieval event in Leonard Stringfield's 1991 volume about crash saucers. And I didn't think a lot about it until one of these newer MJ-12 documents mentioned the crash in Missouri. And I decided I was going to find Charlotte Mann. Grandfather had been called out that someone had called in that there had been a plane crash outside of town and would he be willing to go to minister to people there, which he did. Upon arriving, it was a very different situation. It was not, not a conventional aircraft as we know it. There were three entities or non-human um, people there. Two were just outside the saucer, and a third one was further out. His understanding was that perhaps that third one was not dead on impact. So Father did pray over them, give them last rites. Not long after they arrived, military just showed up. I surrounded the area. Grandfather didn't know what was said to the others, but he was told, this didn't happen, you didn't see this, this is national security, it is never to be talked about again. The year following the Cape Girardeau report, Los Angeles was the site of more UFO activity. The LA air raid allegedly produced two more downed saucers, one just off the coast of California. The Army Air Corps also recovered a similar object in the San Bernardino Mountains, east of Los Angeles, which cannot be identified as conventional aircraft. This headquarters has come to a determination that the mystery airplanes are in fact not earthly and according to secret intelligence sources they are in all probability of interplanetary origin. With the United States at war it appears that President Roosevelt saw this interplanetary phenomenon not as a threat but as a great opportunity. I have considered the disposition of the material in possession of the army that may be of great significance toward the development of a super weapon of war. A new super weapon was developed to win the war. 
It was tested in remote areas of New Mexico and Nevada. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer led the top secret Manhattan Project that would change the world forever. This time around, stakes are kind of high. It's going to work all right, Robert. And I'm sure we'll never be sorry for it. Well, we'll know in 40 seconds. As the atom bomb experiments continued, so did the sightings of UFOs. Many believe that it was this nuclear testing that actually drew these mysterious objects to the area. The government's first official UFO program study showed that UFOs were very interested in things atomic, things that uh, generated plutonium. And our documents also show that. Specifically, there's one case where they talk about a crash site just a half a mile from the Trinity site, which is the first atomic test on the planet. This is the gallant crew that rode the big super fort which carried the first atomic bomb to Japan. Piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbetts, Jr. of Miami, carrying Navy Captain William Parsons of Chicago, who helped design the bomb as observer, and Major Thomas Farabee of Knoxville, North Carolina, who pulled the plug on Hiroshima, the B-29 dropped its load of atomic death, which exploded with a force equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. When the bomb was dropped on Japan in 1945, the war ended, but the UFO activity did not. In June of 1947, physicist Albert Einstein and nuclear scientist Robert Oppenheimer drafted a report offering their opinions on how to deal with extraterrestrial biological entities if they did indeed exist. It is difficult to predict what the attitude of international law will be with regard to the occupation by celestial peoples of certain locations on our planet. But the only thing that can be foreseen is that there will be a profound change in traditional concepts. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico and sent to Wright Field, Ohio for further inspection. When news of a crashed saucer near Roswell, New Mexico hit the airwaves, the government was ready. The saucer quickly became a downed weather balloon, and a policy of evasion became the order of the day. It would last for decades. I think the U.S. Air Force explanation that mogul balloons what crashed at Roswell is just specious. Uh, first of all, the timing is wrong. The technologies are wrong. Uh, certainly pieces of a mogul balloon or the sensor systems attached there too would have been identifiable and they aren't. I believe that these kinds of answers actually do a disservice both to the American people and to the Air Force itself. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena or as light aberrations. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed